All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to SQL Injection Isn't Dead, Smuggling Queries at the Protocol Level, uh, or how I also like to call it, SQL Injection Lower Decks. Because usually with SQL Injection, we are at the high level, like where the captains are at the bridge, and they speak their business language and query language and business logic. But today, uh, we're going to go down to the engine room where the mecha mechanics are and where they shift around their bits and bytes like this. So as a small teaser, um, this is a HTTP request handler that just takes a user ID from the body and then makes a prepared statement for a user of that ID. And if you think this looks safe against SQL injection, then you should stay because I'm going to prove you wrong. A bit about me, I'm Paul. I'm a vulnerability researcher at Sonar where we look at a lot of code and try to find vulnerabilities there. And in general, I love to break web stuff. And I also love to play and organize CTFs with flux fingers. And we actually make the Haklu CTF and the challenges are still up, so you should uh, still play them. And yeah, today we're going to first look at the rough idea of my research. And then we're going to go into attacking database wire protocols. Uh, and there we're going to look at Postgres and MongoDB and what can go wrong uh, inside their protocols and implementations. Then we're going to look at real-world applicability of all this research and then uh, yeah, sum it up with some future research inspirations and takeaways. So the idea in a very short sentence is request smuggling, but for binary protocols. Uh, and of course, when I talk about request smuggling, I have to mention James Kettle's research, who made this uh, yeah, style of attack popular in the last years. And uh, as a quick summary, uh, in his research, uh, we have a proxy and an application, and they speak HTTP between each other. And then the attacker sends something to the proxy that messes up the communication between the proxy and the application so that they get desynchronized. So, uh, yeah, they don't really speak uh, on the same level anymore and things go wrong. But today we're going to do it for binary protocols, uh, where instead of a proxy and an application, we have the application and the database where the attacker wants to mess up the communication. And, uh, of course, there's no HTTP involved uh, between those two, uh, but other protocols that we'll see. But why attack the database connection from the application and not something else? Uh, well, if we find something, it will probably have a good applicability because almost every web application has a database. Then uh, it should also have a quite high severity because databases handle interesting data like personal information or data that's relevant to the application, like authentication data. And of course, we might have good exploitability because there's usually always at least one query where we can control some part of it. Usually it's properly escaped, but at least we have some control. All right, let's uh, now after this bit of theory go into the practical stuff. Um, so first I have a small comparison between the protocols of three popular databases. Uh, and for Postgres, this is what a typical message uh, looks like that is sent over the wire from the application to the database when a query uh, should be made. First, we have one byte uh, of type that just says, well, this is a query uh, message. Then we have a four byte length field and then a value that depends on the type. In MySQL, it looks similar. We have a three byte length field this time, then also a sequence field, uh, and then also a value that contains more information about what kind of message this is. And finally, MongoDB, where we have a, bit, a little bit bigger header. Uh, we also have a 4-byte length field, and then later also a 4-byte opcode that basically tells what type of message this is. And then the value is a more complex structure uh, that I'm going to go into later. All right, Postgres, we're going to go into this one. It's a quite popular database. And if we look closer again at, at this header or message structure, we have a 1-byte type, we have a 4-byte integer, and our value and our four byte length uh, field um, has uh, a limitation. It has four bytes, so there's a maximum number that you can rep represent with those. So what might happen if we somehow try to send a query that's larger than what can fit in there? Uh, let's see uh, what can happen. And here I have the first uh, bug in a code snippet. This is from the PGX library. It's written in Go, and this function is supposed to encode a bind message uh, into its byte rep representation so that it, that it can then be sent over the wire. So first, um, the message type is written, the B, 
then it saves that the size should later be written directly after this b. Then it uh, encodes all the rest of the message and appends it to the buffer. And then finally, it writes the size to this offset we saved earlier. And to do this, we slice the buffer to just the stuff we want to measure. Then we take the length of that. And this returns uh, a value of type int, which on most modern systems is a 64-bit integer, so quite big. But then this gets explicitly uh, truncated down to an int 32, because that's what fits into the protocol, right? We cannot write a 8-byte integer into 4 bytes. So here uh, we need to truncate. But this, of course, also means that if the length was bigger than what can be represented with an int 32, this truncation <coughs> makes a very big length, super small, and now the application writes a wrong length to the wire, so when the database wants to parse it, things go wrong. Uh, let's look at this again with uh, example messages and see how, how they get messed up. Uh, so this is a very small uh, valid message example. Uh, we have a 4-byte value, 4 A's, and then we have a 4-byte length. So in total, this is the length of 8. And that's what gets written to the message, and all is well. This is the biggest message that still works. Uh, we have almost 4 gigabytes of A's, so this uh, fills the length to its maximum value, uh, but still it can be represented, so the message sends it like this, and the database parses it the same way, and all is okay. But now if we make it just a little bit larger, uh, we can see that the number can no longer be represented in our 4 bytes. And so a very small uh, length, only the least significant 4 bytes, are written to the wire, and when the database tries to pass this message, it just sees, oh, there's a very small 4-byte uh, message, and after that, let me parse the next message. But of course, the bytes that are sent after should still be part of the value. This is what the application intended. But uh, since it made the truncation flow a flaw, uh, the bytes are sent and the database understands them wrong. And, of course, just a bunch of A's are not understandable by the database, so it will cause a fatal error and close the connection. But as an attacker, we could choose these bytes to look like a real message, and then the database will pass and execute that message. So let's zoom out again to, to understand how this looks uh, from a lower, uh, higher perspective, because this is the core concept, so you should really get it. First, this is the small and uh, valid message, no problems. Then this is the large but still representable message, and again, application and database see this the same way. But then if we make it a bit too large, the application thinks it's writing a big number, um, but actually it's writing a very small number. So when the database parses this, it sees a very small first message and then a bunch of garbage A's. But if the attacker chooses those A's to be looking like a real message, then the database sees the second message and executes whatever is in there. In this case, it adds an admin user. So this is of course bad. And uh, with this, you can inject entire SQL statements into the connection between the application and the database. Um, and this is not limited, like your very classical SQL injection where you do like a union-based uh, injection or a subquery maybe where you can only do selects. It's more like if you have stack queries enabled where you can inject a whole new statement that's, that doesn't have to be a select, it can be an insert or maybe even copy from program or you change some database settings. So this basically allows the attacker to read, write, or delete all data in the database with the permission, permissions of the application. The only thing that's a little bit less convenient than with usual SQL injections is that exfiltrating data is a little bit more involved because while we inject a new message into the, uh, into the, pro uh, into the communication, it will also cause another response from the database. So the application only expects the response to the first message it intended to send, but there will be another response after, and that will hold the data we want to exfiltrate. So uh, then it depends entirely on the application and the library, how that is uh, processed, but there's still plenty of ways to go around this, for example, inserting the data into some other table and then just read it via normal features of the application. Um, all right, maybe some of you paid attention and thought, well, if we control all of these A's to make it look like a real message, why couldn't we just put a, a real SQL statement in the first place? And you would be right, because it was just an example. Uh, so let's see how it looks, how it looks in the real world. Um, here we have the example from the beginning again. And again, the ID is user controlled. In this case, it's just a normal user ID. 
and then this query happens, so this results uh, in this packet being sent. Uh, we have a quite small length, and then there's the query string with the user ID interpolated into it, and a null byte at the end, which is perfectly normal. And now if the attacker sends a huge ID, uh, then somehow the length got shorter than before, even though we sent more data, so we already see something's weird. And when the database tries to parse this, it will see, oh, the length of 38 bytes, let me read those 38 bytes and parse it as a message, and everything that comes after that uh, will be the next message. Um, so we can see that directly after the very first A of user or attacker controlled input, we need to put the fake message bytes. But how can we know this offset? Of course, the offset depends on where in the query the injection is and how long the query is in total. And if we know both of these things, we can just calculate the offset. For example, if it's an open source target or we can leak uh, the query via error messages, uh, and then we calculate the offset and do the attack and it just works. But maybe we don't know what the query looks like and what the offset will be, so what could we do in this case? And uh, this got me thinking for a while and uh, I found a cool technique. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain all the nitty gritty details of the technique, but this is uh, what it results in. So we send such a pattern that is alternating queues and zero uh, null bytes. And uh, if we hit any of the queues as the, where the offset aligns, then this is how all of this is parsed. The queue is parsed as the type, which is a valid type. Then the next four bytes parse as the length, and this is not a small length, but also not too big, so it fits into the logical size limit of Postgres messages. Next to the four bytes of total limit, we also have a, a logical limit where Postgres says anything larger than this is just wrong, but it fits, so it's good. And the value, even though it's syntactically not a valid query, uh, also doesn't cause a fatal error, just some syntax error where the database will complain, but not close the connection. So the attack works. But on the other hand, if we hit one of the null bytes as the first byte uh, where the offset aligns, then the null byte is the type, which is not a valid type. The length is passed like this, and it's larger than the logical limit, so the database will close the connection. Um, the value would be okay, but overall it just doesn't work out. So with this, we have success after at most two attempts, because each attempt has a 50% chance of success, and if the first one doesn't work, we just shift everything by one byte, and then next time uh, it should work. And we can just repeat the attack because usually applications have connection pools or they reopen uh, closed connections to be still functional. So we can use that um, to just continue uh, the attack, but we just need two attacks. After finding these vulnerabilities and uh, checking that it's exploitable, uh, we also checked uh, which libraries are vulnerable to this. And um, this is not all of the ones we looked at, but uh, the interesting ones. So we can see that for Go, all of the four ones we looked at were vulnerable and exploitable. And I'm going to go uh, into the detail between vulnerable and exploitable later. Uh, unfortunately, only one of them fixed this after we reported it. The other ones either completely ignored us or we couldn't reach the maintainers, or they first communicated but then stopped. Uh, in C Sharp or .NET world, we found one that was vulnerable and exploitable, uh, and they also fixed this and backported the fixes to older branches, which was uh, very nice to see. And then in Java and JavaScript, we found some libraries that in theory weren't handling large sizes correctly, but um, due to other things, it was not exploitable, which I'm going to, uh, going to go into detail later. With that set of vulnerable libraries, we also went and look out, looked out for exploitable applications. Um, so uh, we found some applications that, in theory, use these libraries, but we couldn't confirm if they're exploitable or not. This is, includes Grafana or Git-T. Then we had a subset of that where we found a specific non-default configuration to be vulnerable. This includes Metamost and Gox. And then there's also the sweet spot for attackers where the application is vulnerable in its default configuration. And uh, this application was Harbor. It's a container registry, so you can push and pull Docker images to this registry. It's a CNCF graduate project, which means it's uh, quite mature and people are using it. It's also part of VMware Tanzu Kubernetes. Um, we didn't check if it's, if it's exploitable in this context, but uh, just noted this. 
And yeah, again, it's default in the default configuration, it is vulnerable or was vulnerable. Uh, and you don't, didn't even need authentication. Uh, in fact, the exploit can attack the authentication endpoint. Um, they fixed this uh, in version 2.11 by just updating to the fixed version of PGX. So if you have an instance of this, uh, you want to uh, update it. And I'm gonna try to show a demo for this. Um, so I hope this works on the Wi-Fi. Uh, first, uh, we're going to see if we can log in with attacker attacker, which should not work. We should get an error message. Maybe the Wi-Fi is bad. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, it's slower, but it works. So we can see we cannot log in with attacker attacker, um, which is uh, expected. But now if we run the exploit, that hopefully works. Um, it should soon send uh, a large payload, like I described earlier, to the application. And it doesn't look like it's working, so I'm gonna switch to the video in the sake of time. Um, so we run the demo, it sends a query to the, uh, to the Harbor instance. The query is an insert query uh, that will insert a new admin user called attacker with the password attacker. And of course, this takes some time to send four gigabytes. Um, but uh, soon we should see an error message from the demo script, which is intended or expected, uh, because yeah, the injection, the protocol smuggling will cause some errors in the application, but still the attacker controlled uh, query went through, and now the attacker can log in and has administrator rights. All right, um, now we're quickly going to look at MongoDB as well to show you that it's not a Postgres only thing. Uh, it's a more broad uh, thing that uh, has more broad implications. So again, this is how the MongoDB wire protocol looks. Um, we have a four byte length field again, and then we have the opcode field and the value. And uh, yeah, as I said, the value is a little bit more complex. Uh, it's an encoding called BSON, which I think stands for binary JSON, and yeah, it's what it sounds like, you have a nested object structure like in JSON, but it's encoded to a binary representation. And here again, I have some code. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through it. Uh, it's a little bit longer. So first, uh, here, the function from the official MongoDB Rust driver um, builds the content of the message, this BSON document, and gets it as a list of bytes. Then it calculates the total length of the message. Uh, which includes the length of this uh, of this value, and this is stored as a u size, so again a 64-bit integer on most modern systems. And then again, this is explicitly truncated down to an int32 um, because it has to fit into the four bytes of the protocol, and there's no check for an overflow or a truncation before. So we have the exact same situation as before, uh, but the exploitation is a little bit more involved here because we have to avoid some bad bytes. Um, this is due to how Rust and this library handle strings, and they all must be valid UTF-8, so there are certain byte sequences we cannot put in. And the problem is, uh, one of those byte sequences is DD07 in hex, uh, which is the message type that we need to send to do the attack, but we can't put it in a string because it's not valid UTF-8. And also sometimes some size fields might become valid UTF-8 sequences as well. But the solution is just to use some other metadata to create those bytes. And I'll show you an example uh, for this. So here on the left, you can see a normal MongoDB query. It just queries a movie based on some properties. And this gets encoded to this BSON document, um, where first in blue, you have the length of the total document. Then in red, you have a type byte that shows, well, the next key value pair has a string value. Then again in blue, oh, sorry, in yellow, you have the key, the title in this case. Um, this has to be a valid UTF-8 string. And then in blue, you have the length of the following value, which also which is also a string. Um, and yeah, so in the yellow and the green parts, we cannot put any invalid UTF-8 sequences. But in order to put our, uh, our DD07 sequence in, we can abuse the length of a value uh, by just making the value just as long so that the length will be the bytes that we want. Uh, and then we can based on this craft the whole uh, injected message, which is uh, still some work to do, but this is the trick that you need to do it. Again, here we looked at 
different libraries, but the Rust implementation was the only one we found to be vulnerable and exploitable. Um, but they also fixed this and uh, yeah, released a new version so you can update. And we didn't find any relevant application that used this library, at least not an open source one, so I don't have a demo for this. But uh, if you were using it, let me know, I would be interested. All right, uh, let's now take a step back and look at the real world applicability of this. Because uh, we've seen all the bugs and the exploit and, and all the things we can do, but does it really work in the real world? And the elephant in the room that we need to talk about is of course the four gigabytes of data that we need to send for the attack. Uh, because most of you might have already thought, well, aren't there firewalls and other limitations that don't allow you to send just big data streams into my application? And you would be correct. Usually there's a lot of stuff that limits this, like reverse proxies that limit the body size, uh, or the HTTP server has a default size limit for, for the body or for the whole request. <clears throat> Maybe the JSON or form decoding library has also a limit and much more. But of course, this is never 100% bulletproof. So uh, I listed up some potential bypasses. One thing is that maybe some endpoints are just unprotected. Maybe they have no default limits or they disabled the limits. This was the case with Harbor, for example. Um, maybe the attacker can use compression um, because sometimes the size check is done on the compressed data and if it uh, then gets decompressed, the size check is quite irrelevant. This is, for example, the case with Nginx or the Fastify JavaScript framework. Then there's also web sockets, so a different channel of sending data. These uh, also allow large message sizes and they have compression support and many filters that apply to your usual HTTP requests don't apply to each individual web socket message. And then finally, uh, this is quite cool because it allows you to, be, to get creative and find new ways. Uh, and this is, you just make the server create the big string for you. You don't have to send it uh, all the way. For example, you can use SSRF to pull a big uh, payload that is then included in a database query, or maybe you can use some templating to create uh, a large uh, value iteratively. And this depends on the business logic of the application, but I think uh, in many cases you can find something that you could use for this. Then uh, we've seen that some languages seem to be more exploitable than others. Um, so let's look at some language comparisons here. First, um, in which languages can these integer overflows or truncations actually happen and where they happen silently? And then uh, how big can strings and buffers be in certain languages so that the, the language can still handle them? So for the integer overflows in the middle column, we have the addition overflow where you just add two values and if they overflow and don't throw an error, this is green. So in Go, Java and C Sharp, this is the case. In Rust, in production builds as well and JS and Python are not vulnerable to this. Uh, on the right column, we have the serialization overflow, which is when you have a, a standard library function that you give an integer that it then writes to a fixed size byte field if this checks if the integer fits or not. And in most of the cases, the type system of the language prevents this. <coughs> so the developer has to do the casting before, which we've seen in the two code examples. So this just shifts the responsibility to the developer and developers do make mistakes. So um, yeah, this can also be exploitable. And then here now we have the secret why the Java and JavaScript libraries were not exploitable. And this is because both Java and JavaScript cannot really handle large strings that are large enough that their length would cause the truncation or overflow. So uh, if I send a four gigabyte string to Go, it will be just happy. But if I do it to a Java application, it will complain and say, well, I cannot handle such a big string, so it will never uh, enter the vulnerable path of the library, and that's why it was marked as unexploitable. So to sum this up, um, we can definitely send large payloads in a lot of cases, maybe not all of them, but I think there's plenty of techniques to be used. Then in many languages, overflows and truncations can happen, or the developer does them for you to be able to use the function. And we've also seen that real-world applications can be exploited with this, like Harbor. So for some future research inspiration, which I hope uh, some will join me in, um, I first have to give the disclaimer that uh, please don't uh, start sending four gigabytes of data to every bug bounty endpoint in your scope uh, right now. 
because you will just DOS the application and get banned and uh, yeah, ruin the day of a DevOps engineer. So please don't, only if you do it in your own lab or if you have explicit consent. But uh, if you do it in your lab, then please do all of these things. So research more protocols. There's other databases. There's other third-party systems that applications talk to. They all have protocols, and a lot of them have fixed size length fields. Then there might be other protocols that use maybe delimiters. So there's also something to be found, uh, maybe new techniques there. And it would also be cool to have some more techniques to smuggle large payloads into applications. Uh, maybe some generic server-side creation techniques uh, would be very cool. <clears throat> and of course, if you want to get started, um, I made a challenge for this. Uh, as I said, we organized the Haklu CTF last weekend, and uh, the challenge is still up. So if you want to test out these uh, truncation and uh, protocol smuggling attacks, you can go here. The challenge is called FLX lock, and you basically have to uh, hack a keypad and a door lock they're just virtual, not real ones. But uh, yeah, your goal is to get access and uh, both talk to each other via MQTT, just as a hint. Um, all right, now let's sum things up. Uh, so first of all, I think this is the most important point, um, is that apparently integer overflows are still relevant in memory-safe languages. Uh, of course, in C, we all know that if you have an integer overflow, it will likely lead to memory corruption, which will likely lead to code execution. So all the C developers, or most of them, know about this kind of bug class and try to prevent it. But all the other developers, they don't have to care about it. Because usually, the worst that can happen is some exception gets thrown and maybe your application crashes, but usually not even that. So, well, it's just an SK edge case. We can handle it later. We write a to-do comment. Uh, but today we've seen that uh, if you target the right things, you can still have a, a significant impact uh, with these data-only attacks where you attack, for example, a protocol that uh, then gets messed up and things uh, happen down the road. Then, of course, we've seen that sending large amounts of data is definitely feasible. Um, so if you write an application and you think, oh, no way that somebody will send four gigabytes in here, my app, uh, firewall will handle it, then uh, I would uh, urge you to please do the check in the code as well and don't just trust on that. And finally, to get back on the talk title, SQL injection isn't dead. Of course, it was never dead in the real world. Uh, there's plenty of real-world SQL injections uh, still happening. But in theory, developers have the right tools to do everything right. They have ORMs, they have query builders, and so on. Um, so even if they use all of that uh, as a researcher, if you can't hack it, you just need to go a level deeper. Thank you. Thank you.